Welcome to Sweet Fuel, the remarkable story of Brazilian ethanol, brought to you by the Ohio State University History Department, Cleo Society and College of Arts and Sciences, and by the Center for Latin American Studies, a Title VI National Resource Center funded by the U.S. Department of Education. My name is Nick Breifogel. I'm an Associate Professor of History and Director of the Goldberg Center for Excellence in Teaching, and I'll be your host and moderator today. Thank you so very much for joining us. As the hazards of carbon emissions increase and governments around the world seek to reduce reliance on fossil, fossil fuels, the search for clean and affordable alternate energies has become an increasing priority in the 21st century. However, Brazil has already been producing such a fuel for almost a century. Its sugarcane-based ethanol is the most efficient biofuel on the global fuel market, and the South American nation is the largest biofuel exporter in the world. Today, we are privileged to welcome Dr. Jennifer Eagle, who will offer a historical account of the industry's origins. The Brazilian government mandated a mixture of ethanol in the national fuel supply in the 1930s, and the success of the program led the military dictatorship to expand the industry and create the national program pro Alcool in 1975. Private businessmen, politicians, and national and international automobile manufacturers together leveraged national interest to support this program. By 1985, over 95% of all new cars in the country ran exclusively on ethanol. And after consumers turned away uh, from them with oil, uh, when oil was cheap, the government successfully promoted flex fuel cars instead. Yet the growth of this green energy came with associated environmental and social costs, first in the form of water pollution from liquid waste generated during ethanol distillation, and second, through exploitative rural labor practices that reshaped Brazil's countryside. Let's take a moment to get to know our speaker. Dr. Jennifer Eaglin is a historian of Brazilian alternative, sorry, is a historian of Brazilian alternative energy development. She is an assistant professor of environmental history and sustainability and a core faculty member of the Sustainability Institute at Ohio State. Her first book, Sweet Fuel, a Political and Environmental History of Brazilian Ethanol, just came out with Oxford University Press, and she'll be discussing her findings with us today. She's joining us now from Freiburg, Germany, where she's currently working on her next book project on the Brazilian nuclear energy industry. With that introduction, let me just mention quickly the plan. The plan. Professor Eaglin will begin with a presentation on the history of ethanol in Brazil, and then she'll take your questions and we'll open things up for discussion. If you're interested in asking a question, please write it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen on Zoom, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. And now, without further ado, let me pass you over to Professor Jennifer Eagle, who will take us on an exploration of the remarkable story of Brazilian ethanol. Over to you, Professor Eagle. All right. Uh, well, first, let me just say thank you, Nick. Thank you to the Goldberg Center, the Center for Latin American Studies and the College of Arts and Sciences for having me. Um, and, hope, and thank you to all of you for, for joining uh, for hopefully a, a really interesting conversation about my research. So as noted, um, my research focuses broadly on alternative energy development in Brazil and particularly sugar-based ethanol development. I, I actually, began studying this, this industry, um, in, this Brazilian industry first, when I was studying corn-based ethanol development in the United States. And, and, and many of us are probably familiar and probably have very strong opinions uh, about the corn-based ethanol industry. But um, many of us probably have did not know that Brazil uh, was a large sugar producing uh, or not large sugar producing, but a large sugar based ethanol producing country. Um, and so these are some of the questions that that I too was was once unaware of and really drove me uh, to do a, a larger, longer history of of this industry. And really, what I found was that uh, that Brazil's experience with ethanol, um, ha, goes far, way further back than, than I had really expected. And that ethanol has been 
um, a very important part of Brazil's energy infrastructure for um, large parts, most of the 20th century, and, uh, and in ways that have become very normalized um, and, and present very interesting examples or lessons about what energy transitions of the present and the future might look like as we search for uh, alternatives to petroleum to power our, um, our vehicles in, um, in our climate ridden uh, world. So I wanna talk about some of the main themes uh, or one of the main themes that kind of draws out um, some of the themes from the book, which is really how does ethanol, Brazilian ethanol um, become an important part of Brazil's energy infrastructure? And how does it actually get the image of being a green industry? Because one of the things I really found is that um, celebratory accounts of ethanol because of its lower carbon emissions than, than petroleum often leave out the more complicated uh, history of, of what actually bringing this, this, this energy to a large scale um, commercial market uh, really involved and, and what were some of the costs that came along with it. So, um, so for my talk today, we're gonna start by just a brief introduction to Brazil. And, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, give a brief introduction of ethanol itself and then kind of jump into um, this, this particular history. So for those of us that are not familiar with Brazil, I have a, a map over here. Um, and just a quick overview in, we are probably familiar with Brazil's, uh, Brazil is the, um, the host of the largest part, the vast majority of the Amazon rainforest, but its economy is really driven by the Southern region. And this is particularly, uh, this particularly includes the, the cities of Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. Um, and so my research focuses on Sao Paulo, which is the largest um, industrial center in South America. So Brazil, it was founded, um, quote unquote, it was, um, became a, col a, a colony of, of Portugal in the 1500s, after which its history was really closely tied to um, sugarcane for most of its, most of its history um, as, as a major agricultural product. And so um, really after its colonial inception, sugar comes to define Brazil's economy for centuries. And actually Brazil was the largest producer uh, and exporter of sugar in the world for a couple centuries. Um, but, and so these are some of the ways that sugar in Brazil has been a foundational part of, of Brazilian society. Um, and, earns a, an important part in its political uh, structure as well, right? So, um, so as sugar eventually um, is going to be unseated by, uh, by other agricultural and mining products that, that come to really drive the Brazilian economy in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, which um, includes gold, rubber and, and actually in the 19th century and well into the 20th century, the leading agricultural export in Brazil was coffee. Um, and so even as these other products become really important and actually sugar, um, the sugar industry starts to struggle um, where they are, they really lose the kind of international market to other, other regions, particularly other countries in the Caribbean that become large sugar um, producers, even as Brazil's um, sugar industry loses that, that important place internationally, domestically, Brazil's sugar industry and, and sugar producers still hold a very significant political, um, um, very significant political power in the, in the country. And so this is actually really linked to the foundations of how Brazil's sugar ethanol industry uh, really is created. So 
as the sugar industry is struggling, particularly by the beginning of the 20th century, it, it's really lost the, the export market and it's overproducing sugar on the domestic market. And so sugar producers are going to push the Brazilian government for um, some kind of economic help as this, this industry is really in spiraling. And so ethanol becomes part of that solution. So a quick little background on ethanol. Ethanol or ethyl alcohol, um, and as it's known in Brazil, alcohol, um, it can be distilled from any agricultural, starchy agricultural uh, product, whether that be corn, um, potatoes, grapes, or sugarcane itself. In the um, basically in this production process uh, for for producing ethanol from sugarcane. Uh, and I always like using this picture because it, it kind of illustrates like how this is what sugar cane actually looks like. Um, you crush the cane and then you, from the cane, like you, you have the cane juice on the inside and that really becomes the, the product from which so many other products uh, are really are produced in the sugar and ethanol industry. Um, so you could mill it into sugar cane or you can use the cane juice um, or molasses, another byproduct to, uh, you add yeast and you distill it, distill it, distill it. And low, low grade distillations of, um, of, of this product, it really are, are, is drinking alcohol, um, like rum or cachaça, the, a very popular um, sugar alcohol in Brazil. Um, and high grade distillations are potent enough to run engines. So the technology to use ethanol as a fuel has been around basically as long as the internal combustion engine has. And early supporters of using ethanol uh, rather than petroleum to power vehicles included Henry Ford and Thomas Edison among others. And, and another interesting part of this history is Brazil is going to start investing in ethanol, um, but actually Brazil is not the only country that invests in developing ethanol as a, as a fuel option um, in the early 20th century. So, so actually Germany and France are going to be uh, really centers of ethanol development at the beginning uh, in the early 20th century. And, and what's notable about this, why would these three countries be uh, important investors in ethanol. And it's really that the three, all three of these countries are not large or did not have large oil reserves. And so um, as oil, uh, petroleum is becoming a more important part of industrialization, uh, as automobiles are becoming a more important and more popular global products, um, countries around the world started to say, well, well, if we don't have oil reserves, what are we going to do to be able to, um, to compete, to be able to, to, to work with these products, right? And so um, in the Brazilian case, uh, really globally, this becomes a particular point of angst for, for governments at, in the 1920s after World War I, where oil, petroleum, and, and vehicles had become a very important part of this, of this conflict, uh, or, or at least access to this, this energy was a very important part of, of the war. And so the, so the Brazilian government is going to begin investing in state-sponsored research on the use of ethanol, um, sugar-based ethanol, uh, in automobiles. And, and, in the 1920s. And the research, the research uh, that these Brazilian uh, researchers found was that um, ethanol could be mixed in, um, in cars in, with, mixed with gasoline at a rate of up to about 20, 25% without having to make any changes to the engine um, and without damaging the car. Uh, or the automobile, um, it could efficiently run. These, these cars could efficiently run. And so this research becomes the foundation for Brazil 
the Brazilian government really um, uh, looking to ethanol as the, the way that they are going to support the sugar industry. And remember, I already said, sugar producers are pushing the government to find some way to support this ailing industry. And this research becomes the foundation of tying that support to the creation of a domestic ethanol industry. So in 19, uh, they do this in two ways. In 1931, the Brazilian government is going to pass a 5% mandated mixture of ethanol in the national fuel supply. Um, and then in 1933, they're going to create the Institute for Sugar and Ethanol, uh, the Institute, oh, Instituto de Azúcar y de Alcohol. And so this really ties the future of the sugar industry to creation of an a domestic ethanol industry where sugar producers that had been overproducing sugar uh, for export could then redirect that sugar toward, uh, or at least redirect, redirect that cane toward domestic ethanol production. So this 5% this mandated mixture in the, in the fuel supply is gonna remain in place for the next 40 years, um, really with very little change. And so um, sometimes it went up um, as it did during the 1940s um, uh, around World War II. And actually, this is also, this mixture is going to sustain, sustain even when um, domestic politics are going to kind of attack this, this ethanol, um, this ethanol initiative, this ethanol incentive, um, such as in the 1950s when Brazil, which finally found domestic oil reserves in the late 1930s and in the 1950s finally found its own um, national petroleum industry, Petrobras, uh, they're going, the Petrobras officials are going to uh, increasingly say, we don't need this mixture. And, and here's where sugar producers, private sugar producers are going, again, their political influence uh, and their political power is going to help sustain the, this, this mixture in the national fuel supply, even when it becomes unpopular. Um, this also sustains as Brazil moves from a democratic government to a military dictatorship in the 1960s, um, as a new military uh, or a faction of the military is going to lead a coup in 1964 and implement a military dictatorship, which was su supremely focused on economic growth and economic development. And so these are some of the, the ways that ethanol manages to remain in this, uh, a small part of Brazil's energy infrastructure for, for decades. But it's not until, it, it, it's worth noting that they're not gonna expand the, this, this ethanol um, industry really a, extensively until the 1970s, but the 5% mandated mixture does mean that the ethanol industry continues to grow and with it, so does it, its environmental footprint. So in this production process of producing ethanol, like I said, you, you're, you're distilling it to really high levels. Um, and in the distillation process, for every liter of ethanol produced, there's 10 to 16 liters of this, this other liquidy byproduct that comes along in, in this production process. And that, that byproduct is, is called venas. So what is Venas? It's made up of, uh, it, I mean, it's a really acidic, really smelly, kind of pulpy, liquidy um, product. And that, um, again, it was actually made of uh, mostly organic material. Well, actually, no, mostly water, 90% water uh, and about 7 or 8% um, uh, organic materials, which includes um, calcium, potassium, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, etc. And so for the most part, as, as this mandated 5% mixture is um, helping support the expansion of this ethanol industry, increased ethanol production also leads to um, increased production of this byproduct, which for the most part, producers just dumped in local waterways. And perhaps we are familiar with the fact that dumping large amounts of organic materials in waterways causes 
algae blooms that led to all a, a, a numer, numerous um, uh, environmental and public health issues. So these are all some of the ways that um, by the 1970s, the ethanol industry was actually uh, considered, was well known to be a very polluting industry. It was one of the most polluting industries in the state of Sao Paulo. Um, and so despite all of this, and, and actually it's really um, local communities that are going to push uh, the government to, to increase regulation of the ethanol industry to make sure that they're not destroying their local waterways. Despite this, really enforcement is very weak. And so ethanol, even by the 1970s, has this kind of checkered environmental, um, environmental history. But despite all of these challenges, ethanol is actually going to increase its um, importance in the Brazilian ethanol infrastructure in the 1970s, um, really in because of global market um, fuel market changes. And, and that comes in with the 1973 oil shock. Um, and this is when um, in 1973, late 1973, uh, the US government is going to provide support to Israel in the Yom Kippur War in the Middle East, um, after which Arab aligned uh, countries in OPEC, the or, uh, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, are going to then implement a embargo on the US and its allies uh, and cut back oil production such that within a span, the span of a few months, by early 1974, global oil prices are going to quadruple. And with that, for a country like Brazil that actually still relied on foreign oil for 80%, about 80% of its um, oil consumption, this has an immediate and a long-term um, impact on Brazil's economic outlook. And again, as I noted, the military dictatorship was supremely focused on economic growth at any cost, right? And so the, this becomes the foundation for um, sugar and ethanol producers really lobby the Brazilian government to increase ethanol's position in the, the country's energy infrastructure as the military government is looking to diversify their energy infrastructure in order to sustain their economic growth agenda. Um, and actually, initially, ethanol was a really small part of that as the government invested in expanded petroleum um, um, speculation and, and actually built the largest hydroelectric, what becomes the largest hydroelectric dam in the world um, and also invested quite a bit in a, uh, a nuclear energy industry or program. But um, it's really in 1975 after due to all of the lobbying from the um, from sugar producers that the the government is also going to create the national ethanol program in 1975. And so the program is really going to go through two central phases. And the first phase is focused on expanding the ethanol mixture from the 5% that had been in place since the 1930s to 20% mixture, which again goes back to that research that had already said this mixture up to 20%, 25% does not, will not negatively affect vehicles. And so based on that, they're going to expand their, um, their mixture of ethanol in the fuel supply, in the national fuel supply to offset petroleum imports. Then um, there's another, uh, another oil shock in 1979 um, that is again going to double, uh, oil prices are again going to double, which, uh, which continues this, um, um, the threat of, of high oil prices on a country that still relies heavily on oil imports. So it's in this, this second phase. So essentially pro alcohol is going to sub, uh, heavily subsidize the production of sugar, heavily subsidize the cost of sugar, subsidize the price of ethanol, subsidize um, ethanol or sugar production, 
uh, machinery to build distilleries, all of these things to incentivize uh, sugar producers to expand their, their ethanol um, production infrastructure. And then they're also, this program is also going to heavily invest in research on the development of a ethanol fueled car. So with the, they're gonna launch the ethanol fueled car in the, in the 70, in, in 1979 at the same time as the second oil shock. Um, so this is also going to expand the program even more. So the creation, the development of the ethanol fueled car had actually, Brazilian researchers had been working on this since the 1950s. Um, and, and so in the 1970s, I mean, what, one of the key issues is um, researchers in Brazil found that um, ethanol higher above 25% in, in standard uh, low compression gasoline powered uh, engines were um, highly corrosive and, and created all these other problems. So you needed to add, adapt the car, uh, adapt the engine to be able to, to run on ethanol. And so um, what researchers found was that high compression engines ran at levels that were comparable to low compression, high compression engines with ethanol ran at levels co comparable to low compression engines with petroleum. Um, and so then they had to actually bring these cars to market. And so that required an extensive amount of research and adaptation of other parts of the car, including uh, the fuel tank, the fuel gauge, uh, carburetors and, and, and other parts. So with the assistance of researchers at Volkswagen of Brazil and also at a Volkswagen in Germany, um, they're going to successfully adapt uh, these cars to, to, for commercial sale. And so actually the first ethanol fueled vehicle to come uh, that was um, available for commercial consumption was the Fiat 147. Um, but this, to be able to bring ethanol fueled cars to market also required a major overhaul of the country's um, fueling infrastructure, right? So you actually have to have pumps at gas stations. You have to have a dis an effective distribution infrastructure. Um, you have to subsidize, as the government did, heavily subsidize the price of these cars to make to incentivize people to buy them subsidize the price of fuel to make sure that people would, would um, buy ethanol rather than petroleum. And, and the list goes on, right? All of these things um, are very expensive, but ended up being very effective. So this is actually a table of, um, of car sales in the 1980s. And so the car first came to market in 1979, and with all of these incentives that I've that I've mentioned, um, the ethanol fuel car is going to very quickly overtake the Brazilian domestic car market. And by 1985, over 95% of all new cars on the road ran exclusively on ethanol. So in a lot of ways, this was considered a massive success, right? You've uh, effectively change the fueling, uh, the fuel infrastructure in um, a matter of, of years. Um, but what ends up happening after that is, is both inspiring and also a reality check in what are some of the costs that come along with this, right? So, um, so first I wanna highlight that uh, I talked about Vinas and, and when, I mean, this Vinas was already a problem before the ethanol, this pro-alcohol program was implemented. But with pro-alcohol, ethanol production is going to expand from about, before the program began in 1975, Brazil was producing about half a billion liters of ethanol per year. By 1979, with the implementation of this first, the first phase of expanding production to, um, to, for the national fuel mixture, Brazil produced about 3 billion liters of ethanol per year. By 1985, to help service these, the, the growing demand associated with ethanol fueled cars, Brazil produced over 10 billion per year. 
A conservative estimate means that at, uh, Brazil was at minimum producing 100 billion liters of Benas per year by 1985. And they already were having problems with this. And so then it, the question became, well, what are we going to do with all of this? And, and really, um, a lot, lots of reports at the beginning of the program in the, the mid-1970s said this ethanol program is going to be um, an ecological catastrophe because, because of Venas dumping. Um, and so what really ends up happening is the with increased government oversight and, and actually innovation within the industry is going to uh, repurpose Venas, which as noted is an organic material laden liquid and particularly a nitrogen laden liquid um, is repurposed as a fertilizer alternative. And so this is another way that then this is sold. Um, and also they're going to dehydrate this liquid and use it as a um, animal feed, much like corn based syrup, um, uh, corn syrup in the United States. Um, and so diversifying the uses of this, um, of, of this byproduct becomes a, a, is considered a technological solution now. Uh, and, and I've done, I did inter, uh, interviews with um, executives in the industry and they said, oh, we fixed that, that Venas problem decades ago. That's, that's no longer a problem. Uh, and that's, that's not entirely true. I mean, uh, oversight be is, becomes a very important part of, uh, of enforcing the diversification of this product, but, uh, or diversified uses of this product, but it's actually still very expensive to store the product um, and to re reprocess the product. And so um, to this day, actually, uh, storage and, and, and waste issues continue to uh, exist within this, this Venas market um, and in ways that, that illustrate some of the continued costs, uh, environmental costs that come along, came along with this large scale application of an alternative fuel industry. So in that, in that context, the question kind of becomes, how does, this, how does this thing become a green energy then, right? How do, why do we think of it as uh, an environmental boon uh, or a potential environmental boon? And, and a lot of that has to do with research that came out in the 1980s um, where um, researchers at the University of Sao Paulo started studying the impact of ethanol-fueled cars um, on air quality in, uh, in urban centers, particularly in Sao Paulo um, in the 1980s. And what they found was ethanol-fueled cars released about 70% less hydrocarbons than uh, gasoline-fueled cars. Uh, they released about... Um, uh, about 13% less nitrogen and about 65% less carbon monoxide. And so these became, uh, these findings became the foundation of reimagining this, this um, ethanol industry that had actually already had all these environmental issues, um, but reimagining it as an environmentally positive uh, product. And so here's an, well, here's a quick illustration of, of what happens as ethanol fuel cars are actually going to lose the market for a series of reasons, um, some of which include um, the collapse of oil prices in the mid 1980s, uh, environmental limits of ethanol, of sugar expansion, um, as droughts are really gonna plague the Sao Paulo region and, and affect um, ethanol production. Uh, and, and, and so ultimately, consumers are going to increasingly lose confidence in ethanol fuel cars. And this, as consumers are losing confidence in ethanol fuel cars, they are going, the sugar industry and government are going to promote a new um, approach to, uh, to ethanol um, promotion. And this is um, what this ad illustrates. So it says, with the ethanol fueled car, you can help depollute the air of your city. And so this is an ad from, from the early 1990s. And it, it's a picture of the Sao Paulo skyline with the universal sign for toxicity um, being the skull and bones embedded in the smog filled sky. 
And it, the ad goes through and lists all of these things, these, these environmental benefits that come along with driving ethanol fueled cars. And so these became, this, this promotion, even as ethanol fueled cars lost the market in the 1990s, became the foundation upon which um, uh, ethanol is going to be able to, to remain an important part of Brazil's energy infrastructure. And then in the 2000s, in 2003, Brazil is going to launch the flex fuel car, which runs on any combination of ethanol and or gasoline. And so this flex fuel car was really the extension of the ethanol fuel car and, and the marketing of ethanol as a green fuel um, that was able to sustain through the 1990s becomes the foundation of a promotion of ethanol in the 21st century as a low carbon uh, fuel of the present and potentially of the future. So I, I, we've, we've come to the end. Um, I want to show one last slide um, just to get conversation started. And this is actually a picture of Brazil's greenhouse gas emissions of the last 30 years. Um, and, and one of the things I wanna highlight, so this illustrates um, agriculture is the yellow line, land change and deforestation in, is the green line. And, and the red line uh, or the red blocks are energy. And so one of the interesting things that happens in Brazil with ethanol, and you can see this particularly here um, in, in, in the 1990s, Brazil has a very low carbon emission rate linked to energy, but an incredibly high uh, um, carbon emissions linked to agriculture and land change. And, and so how does um, the costs of uh, an energy transition, of, of, of having low carbon emissions in their, in, in their energy infrastructure get deferred to other sections of the economy, um, particularly to land change and agriculture um, through this kind of energy transition. And so I, I leave that as, as a little um, food for thought when we think about what were the costs, who paid the costs of Brazil's energy uh, diversification. Jennifer, thank you so very much. That was just a fascinating uh, kind of exploration of, uh, of this, of the history of the story and, uh, and of this kind of remarkable uh, and, and in some ways really kind of unusual story of, uh, of ethanol production in Brazil. And so thank you so very much. We um, will open things up for, for questions uh, from folks who are here in the audience. And if you, ha you have a question, please uh, just type it into the, the Q&A and um, I will ask them away to, uh, uh, to Professor Evelyn here. Uh, we got a few questions that came in um, during the registration period, and so I wanted to kind of start off with a couple of those, particularly, I guess, just sort of starting with the, the sense of the kind of place of, you, know, you told this, this great story of Brazil, uh, the place of this story in the larger uh, kind of energy uh, story of uh, across the world, and in particular, um, I guess two questions that we, we've had that have come in. One was, uh, you know, are, have other parts of the world mirrored this or mimicked this? Have other parts of the world tried to, uh, to produce a, a similar type of, of kind of ethanol-based uh, kind of fuel system uh, based on sugarcane or, or uh, in particular? Uh, and, and given that this is a kind of sugar kind of based uh, system, are, are there lessons for uh, biofuels globally? Uh, that you can take away from this particular story. I mean, obviously in the U.S., we're very kind of corn focused in that regard. But are there are there things to learn in this uh, in uh, that uh, or lessons from this that other countries exploring ethanol in, in its various forms could learn from? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for those questions. Um, um, has this been how how does this fit into a global discussion of biofuels? Um, Brazil's energy, uh, Brazil's ethanol industry has been tagged as a next generation biofuel in a way that um, has often um, 
been juxtaposed with the corn-based ethanol industry in the United States, which um, Brazil's ethanol, sugar-based ethanol is um, uh, notably more efficient than, um, than corn-based ethanol and, and has lower carbon emissions and produces more energy per, per uh, acre or hectare, depending on how you're um, uh, measuring it. And so it, it, the interesting thing is, I mean, often, and also actually the corn-based ethanol industry has, has been um, more explicitly tied to um, food, uh, food uh, rising food prices and, um, and other things that the sugar-based ethanol industry has somewhat been able to evade, sometimes problematically uh, and inaccurately. But the important thing from a, from a policy perspective for Brazil has been um, actually much in, aligned with the United States with corn-based ethanol producers in trying to expand uh, ethanol production to a point where it can be considered a global product. Um, a, a, a very large percentage of the, of the ethanol that Brazil produces is consumed domestically. But they actually also export um, to the United States. The United States produces a very large amount of uh, corn-based ethanol, most of which we consume ourselves. Um, and so in 2007, Brazil and the US signed a memor memorandum of understanding to try to expand um, and bring to scale lar um, ethanol production in throughout the Western hemisphere. and uh, and particularly they focused on large sugar producing countries like the Dominican Republic um, and others within the Caribbean. And so um, how successful has that been? Brazil also invested quite a bit in um, expanding their, their um, biofuel, the biofuel market, investing in, the, in technology in other countries to expand the biofuel market in um, Sub-Saharan Africa as well. Um, and so the, these are ways that this model, that Brazil has tried to sell this model, right? And tried to say, well, our ethanol industry is a good model to, to follow for other countries, large agricultural producing countries. Um, but, and this ties to the question of what are some of the lessons that we can learn? I think it's important. I, I did not talk as much about the the labor issues that come along with ethanol production in Brazil, but the environmental and the labor costs that come along with that are sure to follow in any of these other countries as they try to expand ethanol production. And so I think that's one of the things that often gets swept under the rug when, when talking about um, uh, the ethanol industry's expansion and particularly um, in Brazil's promotion of, of this model around the world. No, that's great. Um, we have a whole bunch of questions coming in. Let me ask you a couple uh, that are sort of uh, kind of technologically uh, focused. Uh, one asks, um, so how much have biotech innovations improved the process of making ethanol in Brazil? And related but not related, uh, as a, a electrical, uh, sort of as vehicle electrification increases worldwide, is there a pushback within Brazil uh, from the agricultural sugar industries against um, kind of electrical cars? I like both of these questions. So, um, so first, the biotech innovations. Um, <clears throat> the really in the 1990s, as I talked about, the ethanol industry. Um, really kind of found itself at a turning point in, in the late 1980s as ethanol fueled cars were starting to lose the market and gasoline prices fell globally. Um, actually part of remarketing ethanol in the 1990s as a green energy involved um, really highlighting um, a major innovation in the industry, which was cogeneration. And so expanding uh, so basically, there's another byproduct, um, um, bagasse, that was often just burned. And so bringing that, doing, um, basically internally burning that to create thermal electricity to make uh, ethanol 
uh, plants basically self-sustaining um, became a really big part and, and eventually actually selling that the excess electricity from thermal the the, the thermal electrical uh, electrical production back to the Brazilian energy grid um, became a really important part of ethanol's con um, energy contribution and actually to this day um, some people some people have actually said that that ethanol's energy el electrical contributions are more important than um, than its actual fuel contributions right and um, and and actually in promotions in Brazil particularly actually around the cop 26 um, they they already said the innovation that has made our electric our um, ethanol is part of the uh, innovation that has made our electricity uh, infrastructure more sustainable so um, I would say that these are some of the ways that technology innovation has has already dramatically improved Brazil's uh, infrastructure, um, Brazil's um, biofuel infrastructure. Um, but the interesting thing I, I will also add is that um, cellulosic ethanol, um, which is celebrated as a next generation um, biofuel, actually produces more vinas than um, than sugar-based ethanol. And so the expansion of these ulterior, um, alternate um, sources like cellulosic ethanol will bring perhaps unexpected um, uh, costs along with it that, that are not often kind of included in the promotional um, vision of them. So, um, so that's my quick answer to, to that. What the second question was about, oh, electrification of yeah, electric the, cars, yeah. Yeah, electric cars. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things in Brazil, electric cars, I mean, actually electric cars in the United States have, are, are still, um, even when we think we're, we see a lot of electric cars around, it's some, they, they actually still only represent like three or 4% of our, our car market. And, and we hope that's gonna change soon. Um, it represents even an even smaller part of Brazil's um, car market. And ethanol producers and car manufacturers have really been trying to develop um, hybrid cars that might be able to run exclusively on ethanol and electricity um, rather than um, uh, fuel or petroleum and electricity. So these are some of the ways that I, at least at present, I haven't seen a, a large pushback from about electrification of the car market in Brazil in large part because they're really very far from, um, from a tipping point on adaptation, uh, I mean, on adoption, but also biofuels, particularly ethanol can still be part of that um, transition. We have several questions about deforestation. Uh, and so I, our, our audience is very curious to know, um, so how much, uh, how much, both historically and today, of deforestation is the result of sugar production, or particularly sugar production for for ethanol purposes, and um, and when policies policymakers in Brazil talk about you know, sustainable biofuels and this sort of thing, uh, are they taking into account you know forest protections and this sort of thing, and and, and then kind of related to your last point, your last question, so do, does all this deforestation, if there's a, is there a link, if there is a link, is that connected to the um, increased kind of agricultural emissions uh, that you showed in that last graph? Um, okay. I love this question. And I, 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 it's such an important question. So thank you guys for asking it. Um, so how does Brazilian ethanol connect to deforestation, particularly of the Amazon, but more broadly um, in, in throughout Brazil? So if we recall at the very beginning, um, I pulled up the map of Brazil. So you have this, this terrible vision, but you have the Amazon up here, right? And then you had all of these kind of uh, urban centers that I mentioned down, down below, like Sao Paulo and Rio. So all of that region of Sao Paulo and Rio um, used to be, or quote, still is part of another major forest um, that has mostly been annihilated in Brazil, and that's the Atlantic Forest. And so 
um, that re the, the Atlantic forest basically kind of crept up to the, the, the very bottom of the Amazon once upon a time back in 1500. Um, and slowly has been, has been the center of industrial, uh, industrialization in Brazil. And so between 1964 and 1985, which is the period of the military dictatorship, but also includes the, the uh, most intense first 10 years of the uh, ethanol of Peralpol, um, sugarcane accounted for the most uh, deforestation of, expansion of sugarcane ac accounted for the most uh, deforestation of the, Amazon, of the Atlantic forest in the South. And particularly in the region that my book focuses on, which is in the Hebat outbreak region. And so these are some of the ways that um, the, uh, the initial expansion of ethanol production is very closely connected to deforestation, but it doesn't, it doesn't get connected to Amazonian deforestation, which tends to get far more attention. Um, but the other thing I wanna note about Amazonian deforestation is that as sugar production expanded to accommodate larger demand of biofuels, um, you also then saw other agricultural products got pushed into different regions of Brazil. Um, the Cejado, which is in kind of in the, the central uh, west of Brazil, um, is going to become the, the major agricultural producer of, uh, of soy. Um, and then slowly that's going to push other products, um, notably uh, agricultural um, um, beef, uh, grazing, cattle grazing, further up, right? And so this is then going to increasingly push uh, into the Amazon. And so these are some of the ways that all of these agricultural products, the, 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 the large scale production of each of these agricultural products is really interconnected in ways that I would say the um, Brazilian sugar ethanol industry uh, very successfully disaggregates, right? So they say like, you're not seeing sugarcane uh, replacing um, uh, as the cause of deforestation in the Amazon. Like it's not sugar that's being produced in the, in the Amazon um, upon deforestation, but all of these things are connected. So as sugar production has expanded into the Cejado, then uh, grazing is pushed even further up and further in. Soy is pushed further up, further in, uh, into the Amazon. So they're all connected. And I think that's really an important um, part of the story of, uh, and also links to agricultural emissions, right? So as land change for uh, land grazing um, maybe gets the most attention, but actually that's linked to the, this move from soy production to cattle grazing. Um, and maybe the soy production was moved from to, to sugarcane, right? So all of these things are part of, um, of the emission story for sure. Right. Um, let me give you two quite different questions, but I'm gonna give them to you together just uh, and just in the kind of last sort of five minutes we have here, uh, I thought I'd throw them both out uh, and you can kind of tackle one or both in whichever ways you'd like to. The first actually has to do with the kind of questions of, of labor issues. Uh, we have a question, what specifically are the labor issues? Do workers suffer from handling the product or are they exploited with low wages? So we, perhaps you could say a few words about, about the labor issues. And then the other question, which, is, uh, which sort of takes you off into, into the new research you're currently doing, but is, uh, could you connect a little bit the discussion, you know, today's discussion about Brazilian ethanol to your recent work on uh, on, on the country's nuclear energy uh, development projects and, and the ways in which those are linked. Um, so yeah, two different directions, but, uh, but I think really great questions. Awesome, I like both of those questions. Um, so thank you for the labor question. Um, I could have done a whole presentation exclusively about the, the labor question. Um, I talk about it quite a bit. I mean, first of all, uh, when I talk about labor, um, you have to connect it to Brazil's long history of exploitation in the name of agricultural production, right? And so um, from its foundation, sugar production brought in 
large amounts of um, of enslaved labor to to work these sugarcane fields and uh, the expansion of pro alcohol um, really drives a uh, another expansion of exploitative labor relations that have really been connected to Brazil's uh, long history. Um, particularly, I talk quite a bit about um, the the ways that pro alcohol the program really could not have succeeded without the um, legal support um, provided by by the military dictatorship, um, by the military government of um, kind of undercutting some of the labor laws that had already been in place to protect workers. Um, and this is really through a, a loophole to allow um, um, a temporary labor, right? So, so they're uh, able to avoid a lot of labor laws by using short-term labor um, seasonal laborers. And, and so these are a lot of the ways that then this is linked to um, movement across the entire country um, of uh, the, the migration of laborers from the northern region down to the southern region, um, also from the interior into the state of Sao Paulo to work in the cane fields. I also talked quite a bit about um, how they were actually able to um, to organize uh, um, and, and the ways that, uh, that they were explicitly limited. I see that we're running out of time. So I'm gonna jump to the other question. Um, so ethanol and my nuclear project, um, right now, one of the things I'm really talking about is, is the military government's diversification strategy and how that was intricately connected to a, an exploitation of natural resources um, that in the in 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 Brazil in the ethanol um, case that relates to water exploitation and and land um, and then also in the nuclear case that really actually relates quite a bit to water and that's really um, a lot of what I'm working on right now so um, yes I will jump out but that was I love those questions hmm? thank you so very much. Um, we have put you through your paces. I, I want to thank you, uh, thank you for uh, for uh, giving us your time today to kind of to take us through this marvelous kind of research and all these findings that you've uh, discovered in this incredible story, this really remarkable story of Brazilian ethanol. Um, so thank you, uh, and I want to thank uh, all of you in the audience for joining us uh, today. Um, and. I'm sure you uh, you join me in in, uh, in thanking Professor Eaglin for sharing her expertise and her passion for history. Perhaps we can give her a, a big virtual round of applause. Thank you, thank you. Um, we'd also like to thank uh, the College of Arts and Sciences, especially Maddie Kerma and Jade Lack, uh, also the uh, History Department, the Harvey Goldberg Center for Excellence in Teaching, Cleo Society, the Center for Latin American Studies, and the magazine Origins, Current Events and Historical Perspective for their sponsorship. And once again, thank you, our audience, for your excellent questions and your ongoing connection to Ohio State. Thank you for joining us today. Stay, stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Yep.